in just a couple of minutes, so please take your seats, okay? We're going to start within five minutes. Thank you. Can everybody hear that? We're starting in five minutes. speakers and musicians who lived and worked with John. And we have tried to keep the program to a reasonable length uh, on speakers. Uh, there are a few changes from the printed program, so pay attention as I introduce folks. Um, we have information on the charities that benefit some of John Iverson's favorite causes and a donation box, and we encourage you to donate. If not today, do it online, do it to the ones you like. Uh, but you know what John worked for, and we've picked out a few that we think are really important. Uh, we have refreshments after the program, so we hope you'll stick around to see old friends, but also for new acquaintances. We did a mini version of this back in November, and I don't think any of us do more than 30% of the people in the room. It's amazing how many different parts of uh, John's life there was. I want to acknowledge Jan Schmidt, an old Wisconsin friend of John's, who could not be here today due to an impending uh, procedure. Jan did an audio interview with John in 1995 about his life that she also published in New York City Magazine and is actually the basis for one of the videos you'll see in the back. So first up are Wayne Hawk and Sahib Amar Khalsa, I guess Wayne is known as Chip too, and they've got another friend with them as well. 
whose name I'm sorry I, I just learned and forgot. Uh, and uh, Wayne, Wayne was a DJ at uh, Berkeley's punk rock radio station KLX when John came in for an interview promoting an upcoming gig for his band, The Stickers. They had a long friendship and saw many concerts together, including Stiff Little Fingers, ex Bruce Springsteen, and Sigur Ross. Um, Sahib Amar Kals, uh, paths crossed with John when they're, since they both teach Kundalini Yoga here in the Bay Area. Later, uh, she discovered that they were both alumni and anti war protesters at the University of Chicago. So here are Wayne Hawk and Sahib and Mark. Yeah, I. Uh say two lines on that. I could go on and talk for probably an hour about my relationship with John. And um, he was one of my closest friends uh, for over 20 years. We went to see a lot of shows together. And for us, rock and roll was really important. The Rolling Stones were the greatest band in the world. We both agreed on that. And he told me many times that his favorite song was Wild Horses. And as his life spun out the way that it did, he told me many times that he wanted me to sing this song at his funeral. So this is the closest we're gonna to get to that. You all know it, you can sing along if you feel like it. Oh, I should turn my amp on here. We also played, it's on, it's on. It's on. It's on. We also played this song with a few short years ago. So go ahead and sing along if you feel like it. You can sing along to the chorus or the verses. If it's going really well, we'll just extend it for an hour or so. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't listen. <laughs> Hey. 
today to honor the life and legacy of Mr. John Iverson and to extend my deepest condolences to his family upon his passing. John was a lifelong social justice advocate as well as a talented musician and songwriter. I'm also privileged to be able to say John was my friend. John was born in 1949 in Duluth, Minnesota, part Chippewa. He was part of the Bois Fort tribe and was involved in activism around Native American tribal sovereignty for many years. He attended college at the University of Chicago in the 1960s. He was active in organizing against the Vietnam War. He also volunteered with the Community Kitchen run by the Black Panther Party and Health Center run by Chicano Brown Berets. John subsequently moved to Madison, Wisconsin where he became involved in labor organizing with the United Farm Workers. In 1973, he traveled to Wounded Knee to support the American Indian Movement, AIM. Their efforts to fend off the authoritarian rule of Pine Ridge Indian Reservation by the sitting tribal president. After a short stint at the Columbia School of Journalism, John moved to Berkeley, where he performed with the Rhythm and Sleaze Review at music venues in the Bay Area. In the late 1980s, he started a band called The Stickers, later renamed very appropriately. Dreams Die Hard. A song of John's criticizing Oliver North gained notoriety on campus radio stations. John continued his work in labor as part of the steering committee for local SEIU 535, where he helped win grievances against the city of Berkeley for underpayment of service workers. After being diagnosed with HIV, John also became active in HIV AIDS advocacy. And that is a he ran successful legal campaigns to change insurance providers' policies on access to vital HIV medications in the 1980s. He was also co-founder of ACT UP East Bay in 1989 and organized demonstrations against restrictive government and corporate AIDS policies. He helped found the Berkeley Needle Exchange in 1990. He was a lifelong supporter of Native American activist Leonard Peltier unsuccessfully pleading with President Barack Obama to grant Peltier clemency 
prior to leaving office. In 2018, he was one of three Wounded Knee 73 veterans honored by AIM. The late Wendell Shurek, Vice Mayor of the City of Berkeley, introduced me, Barbara, to John at an ACT UP rally in Berkeley, highlighting the need to fight against HIV AIDS. He became a mentor and most importantly, a friend. He'll be deeply missed. John's passing is a loss for the entire East Bay community. My thoughts and prayers are with his family at this difficult time. May John's example serve as a guide for all of us in our fight for peace and justice. May he rest in peace. Barbara Lee. And I just would want to add to that that he should rest in peace and we should rest in peace because in the spirit of John, what we should be doing is going out and causing as much trouble as possible, <laughs> particularly <laughs> against the <laughs> could be a pain in the ass, and I don't mean that as a double time. But he was there for all of us, for everything, and we should do the same. He was an unabashed socialist, union member, activist, in the streets, where our voices are listened to. So thank you, Barbara. Thank you all for coming, and um, remember John. Remember him by doing. Thanks. Next up is Ezra Goldstein, who shared an apartment with John for two years while they were both at the University of Chicago. Graduation day, 1970. I was walking into Rockefeller Chapel at the University of Chicago with uh, my mother and my father. At the entrance, we were greeted by this character in garish dress and Native American face paint. Mom, Dad, I said with a mixture of pride and embarrassment, you remember my friend John. <laughs> pride and embarrassment. That pretty much sums up my relationship with John. <laughs> From that day in 1970 to the time I watched him perform Pee on Me as a, as a busker on Castro Street in San Francisco, <laughs> to the last time I saw him in Two Harbors summer before last, when he harangued me very loudly in a crowded cafe into buying a free Leonard Peltier t-shirt. <laughs> But that was John, a provocateur who stayed the course for all the 50 years I knew him, even as I bobbed and weaved. I loved and admired him for his steadfastness, even as he often made me squirm. <laughs> to go back to graduation day, my parents, Midwestern polite, greeted John warmly and took whatever protest flyer he was handing out. What my parents didn't know, what I hadn't told them, was the university was only grudgingly allowing me to graduate and had wished me a permanent good riddance. <laughs> a few weeks earlier, John had been caught spray painting Free Bobby Seal <laughs> on a building on the UC quad. A bunch of us, including at least two people on roller skates, burst into his disciplinary committee hearing, chanting, free John Iverson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I was already on probation. It was an incredibly stupid thing for me to do. But that was John. He inspired you to do stupid things sometimes. <laughs> but right things. To draw you in is as co-conspirators in the pride and embarrassment cabal. Next up, we have Gus Summers. You met John in 1972 in Madison, Wisconsin. You want the mic or what you want? Thank you so much. This is a haiku tribute to beloved John. Boy from Two Harbors became global citizen, supporting human rights, protecting wounded knee, righting wrongs of genocide, indigenous rights. Madison heydays, our youth made us powerful, opposing injustice. Boycotting Gallo, our Black Panthers protect us, know to let us too. Time in Boston full, social worker of the year, honing many skills. Music expressions, I want to set your cat on fire. <laughs> I got my period. <laughs> AIDS conferences, Barcelona and Thailand, trip to Angkor Wat. Yoga for the spirit, tranquil in the eye of the storm, finding inner peace. Story continues, so many lives John touched, legacy remains. Thank you. Next up, we have Marie Coburn, a creative partner in the early days of John's musical career. My connection to John came through music, and we continue to share a love of music throughout his life including my visiting him in Argentina when he was prowling the thrift stores for his Carlos Gardel outfits as he was beginning his South American tango singing career. But today I'd like to share with you the moment in time when John and I got our Sutro bathhouse gig. We met in a semester-long songwriting class in the early 80s. At the end of that class, each student had to give a performance of original songs in front of an audience. Since we'd become friends in class, John and I decided we would play on each other's songs. We would get together in my living room, he'd play bass, I'd play piano, and we'd work on a couple of songs we were going to do for the show. John would record us so we could see how we sounded. We both enjoyed these sessions, and we soon branched out and started playing more of our songs for each other. We discovered we both had a lot of what John called our dirty songs, <laughs> explicitly sexual songs that we hadn't brought to class. <laughs> His leather boys in businessmen, golden showers, my carrots and candles, and death by desire. <laughs> We'd give each other chord charts and play our songs together just messing around. Or so I thought. One day John called. I sent a tape of some of our songs to the Sutro bathhouse. And they want to hire us for a gig. We need to go meet them. This was amazing. At this point we knew six or maybe eight songs together. I was both excited and horrified. So off to Sutro Bathhouse we went to meet with Dion, who was in charge of entertainment. Oh, kids, she gushed, we love your songs. She told us that the shows were two 45-minute sets. John and I had already discussed how we'd have to play more than the few songs we knew, so we were prepared. And we both nodded as if we had 2.45 minutes out. <laughs> Let's see, Dion said, how about two weeks from now? Will that work? 
Oh, 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 I said, um, I'm sorry, but I have a gig in L.A. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you consult her calendar? How about six weeks then? Yeah, that should work. <laughs> Thus began the most wildly creative six weeks of my life. We came up with our stage characters, Veronica Cruz and Johnny West. We were madly writing songs, learning each other's new songs, and piecing together an entire cabaret show of original songs and covers. We called it the Rhythm and Sleeves Review, two 45-minute sets. Uh, John found a Butter Beans and Susie song, I Want a Hot Dog for My Roll, that became our encore number. I want it hot, I don't want it cold. This dog is steaming, he said. <laughs> John would wag various sized hot dogs in my face and ad lib lines during the song, testing both of our abilities to stay in character and sing rather than just fall out laughing. Our entire act was built around the chemistry we had together and having fun. He and I laughed so much, we thought we were absolutely hilarious. <laughs> we figured if we had a good enough time, the audience would come along for the ride. And it worked. Our show was a hit. They loved us at the Sutro, and we loved them. We were put on the monthly schedule. <laughs> on my own, I would have never believed that I was ready for a professional gig. I'd have never sent the tape. But in music, as in every area of his life, John always believed that he was ready. <laughs> it empowered him and gave him an irrepressible, rare, and beautiful boldness. He always believed he was ready, and he was always right. Thank you, Marie. Next up is Mark Viner, who will read a poem for John. Too much paper. Ah, from Finnegan's Lake. My leaves have drifted from me, all, but one clings still. John, I want you to put me in your will. I made a list of what I want. I want you strength of community, pulling people together, your yoga students organizing for Standing Rock, for get out the vote campaigns locally and nationally, your annual birthday dinners, pulling in disparate facts, facets of your life, memories of rounding you up, you and your stuff, driving off to events, <laughs> never once arriving on time, <laughs> the time you bailed on your birthday dinner that you organized, <laughs> rounding up a crew to go out and hear music so it becomes an event, not just an outing, shepherding the city council in the right direction, keeping alive the true spirit of Maudel Chirac. When all is dark, seeing that North Star shining at the end of the tunnel. I want your stamina and stubbornness, tilting at windmills, rocking the boat, working to keep First Nations issues in the spotlight, working to free Leonard Peltier when there is hope and when there isn't, especially when there isn't, when we need it the most never acknowledging categories or limits or boundaries, never giving up, never giving up, never giving up. I want your voice that spoke for Ugandan orphans, that stood up for everyone in the AIDS and HIV community, for single-payer health care, someday, finally. Your horrid Spanish accent Nonetheless, becoming El Norte Americano in Cantatano. <laughs> Speaking truth to power, shouting truth to power, 
yelling truth to power <laughs> until power backs down and we win. I want your sense of humor. <laughs> that surely mean persona. The years of act up street theater. Humor that even you can't control. The insane, rambling stream of consciousness emails and phone messages that start out one place, take a sudden turn, then another, and bring in more people and ideas my spinning head can hope to keep up with. In yoga class, having us on our backs, belly laughing as loud as we can for 60 seconds, then resting to feel the rare effect of uncontrolled laughter in our lives. Ram Das John, your name reflecting the Guru Ram Das, holder of the golden chain, known for humility, service, and deep devotion. Look to for guidance, healing, and protection. Whose mantra is for miracles, where all things become pure, where the impossible becomes possible. Rama Dasa. The energy of the sun, the receptivity of the moon, the grounding of the earth, infinity healing the universe. Johnny Appleseed, Johnny Tango, for leaving the world a better place, for not allowing reality to define you, for allowing us to be part of your journey. Thank you, John. Satnam. Ongoing great folks. <laughs> what can I say? Next up is Dave Motorsbach, a friend from John's Argentinian days, which uh, I'm lucky, glad that Marie got to share, which we've gone down to. Here you go. Thank you. Um, I don't have a written speech, but I just wanted to reflect on a few big memories the Needle Exchange, Act at East Bay, and some of his days in Argentina, John's days in Argentina. But looking around, I, I'm really happy to be standing here looking at you all, reflecting. John, your, your activists, your artists, musicians, community members, and you're, you really look like family of John. And it's really a, a, a powerful feeling to sit and, and look at you all together. Um, I met John when he founded ACT UP East Bay, at which, um, and he recruited me into ACT UP East Bay um, to work on one of their first projects, and that was to start the Berkeley Needle Exchange. And John was an organizer of that. And for folks, folks he, that were here that were part of Act Up East Bay or the Berkeley Needle Exchange, can you like wave your little hands around? And awesome, you guys are you you all are really important and great people. John recruited me specifically to be part of the, the needle exchange that he was organizing. And I heard some before one of the things that I think Marie said was. The time is now, let's do it, there's no waiting. And that was John's approach to that, where people were like, oh, we can't do needle exchange now, it's the, the political situation isn't right, and all that. And he, he basically said, no, the time is now to do it. He recruited me, he said, okay, this is how it's gonna go, David, you, you're a young guy, you'll get arrested, we'll have a court case, <laughs> and that's how it'll be like, okay, yeah, right, I'll do that. <laughs> um, we start, and he, he, he is the, reason that the Berkeley Needle Exchange started. He is the co-founder, right, but, but he was the reason that he brought people together. He did that legwork, that organizing that we all learned from how, how he did that from here, actually, from the um, South Berkeley Senior Center where he was working and got it going and we just started doing it. We met a few times, we made the plan, we started doing it and we did it. And one of the key touches I think that I was really impressed with is that we had to have a baby carriage. And John said, no, it has to not just be any baby carriage, but it has to be one of those perambulator type baby carriages with four wheels. And we were just walking around the corner where, at Hearst and San Pablo with a baby carriage. Um, <laughs> and inside the baby carriage, if you lifted up the little blanket, the sharps containers and the needles and the gore and the blood and all that. And countless people would come and say, oh, look at your little baby. Yeah, this is the needle exchange. Um, and, but it was like almost a year passed and I hadn't gotten arrested. And I was like, John, you know, we've got to do something. You know, this isn't what I signed up for. And he's like, this is what you signed up for. You're, go for it. You know, it's, this is an ongoing thing. It's not the... 
It's not a one-shot thing. This, this is what we do. But we said we need to get arrested anyway. So John and I met and, and others met and we said, we got to do something. We got to get arrested. How do you get arrested? Um, John said, don't worry about that. <laughs> he made some phone calls and the next week the police showed up and people got arrested. And luckily I was about to leave the country so I didn't get arrested. That created a trial. That created one of many trials that, that all worked to get, get us to where we were 20 years ago, that needle exchange was more and more legal and more of a part. And our Berkeley needle exchange continued on with that spirit of John, really independent and outrageous and doing the thing connected to the people. And he started something that's still going to this day and still super powerful. And um, I want to thank all the ACT UP and needle exchange people that were there for that. I stayed in contact with with John and had the, had the luck to live in Argentina with him, where I um, interacted with John in Buenos Aires in the, in, in the classic horror, embarrassment, excitement, <laughs> and pr pride mode as he sang tango, as he went, went that way. And I was doing my version of John at a, younger, at a different age in Argentina, doing the same thing. And if any of you have listened to his tango singing, it's almost impossible to listen to. It's horrifying. It's the, <laughs> the I can't even, I, his voice sounds so crazy and weird. It's like almost un unlistenable. Um, but that's what it sounds like. That's the root sound of the early days of tango in Buenos Aires, the ship, ship workers and the dock builders and the shipping people who all go in these sweaty little bars, all men trying to, and one would sing and the others would dance together. And that's what they sounded like. They actually sounded just like John sounded. And it just came out naturally in this. So when the day that we were walking down the street and I was like, come on, let's do it. Let's do some singing. He started singing and I was just, oh my God. <laughs> and, and people stopped and listened. They're like, yeah, this guy gets it. <laughs> he can't pronounce the words very well, but he got it. And that, that was that was like, that's something really, when you listen to his music, think about it in that way. It's the real thing. And, and so he channeled that. Um, I just want to say thanks to all of you for being friends and ambassadors and emissaries of, of John Iverson. Um, he'll stay with all of us for all the rest of our lives. He'll stay part of our community and our, part of our world. Thank you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. All right. Thank you very much for all that. Uh, again, I wish I'd always gone to Buenos Aires when he was there. Um, next up, we're very happy to have Tony Gonzalez here, who's director of the American Indian Movement West in San Francisco. He's also their liaison of the American Indian Movement to the United Nations, from which he just came back. And he's going to give a few words about John, but then he's also going to read a very important proclamation. Um, and I'll turn it over to Tony. Thank you. Oh, and I also want to mention as he comes up, we've had some wonderful gifts from uh, some comrades of, of his um, that are blessings upon all of us for being Aww. here. And there may still be some uh, back in the back, but uh, thank you very much for bringing that too. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I don't know, uh, John, as well as many of you, but sounds like a real organizer, like a real, a real Saul Alinsky kind of guy. No, no, no bars hold and, and all that. Uh, I have uh, some friends with me here, California American Indian Movement, also want to share uh, our presence. Uh, uh, indeed, this occasion, you know, so much laughter and good feelings. There's a lot of love here. I can, I can sense that, you know. And I, uh, well, John, you know, would, uh, would come to our AIM conference uh, meetings and speak passionately for the release of uh, Leonard Peltier. And uh, I, you know, I had wanted to say uh, earlier that uh, this feeling that I get here is uh, to us, we have the occasion of meeting again after the passing of someone such as such as John, you know, months ago, and uh, we refer to it as wiping away the tears. I think Dosier kind of made reference to that earlier as well, of uh, uh, wiping away. It's that grief and uh, letting go and and feeling good. And uh, you know, John, uh, as I said, would come to our conference and 
and speak uh, passionately for Leonard and I, and I do have a, a Leonard uh, Peltier message here that uh, I'm thankful that Joan or Jane and, and uh, Dossier helped uh, get it uh, from the Leonard Peltier authors from, uh, who was it? Uh, Paulette, Paulette uh, Robidoux, the national director for Leonard Peltier uh, on May 4th. The letter came through and it says, greetings. I had a legal visit with Leonard Peltier yesterday and told him about this wonderful celebration for his wonderful supporter, John Iverson. He asked me to let you all know how much he appreciated John and his wonderful suggestions to move his struggle forward. John was constant not only in his politics, but also in his personal commitment to help bring justice to not only me, but our native struggle for sovereignty. I send my regards and respect and wishes for all of the ancestors to welcome John to the Star Nation. In the spirit of Crazy Horse, Doksha, Leonard Peltier. And uh, with that, uh, it seems that the passing of an era, even with John and so many of, of uh, our leaders, uh, people that uh, passed on whose shoulders many of us stand on today. And uh, my families and our families also uh, have many people passing. But I'm sure John would like us all to live and want his people to live. So I'd like to sing a, a, a verse in a Lakota language of, uh, uh, to the Great Spirit, uh, have pity on me. I want my people to live. Waka toka u wani te te Waka tonka u wani te Wani te Wani te Waka tonka u wani te We u e Waka toka u si mala ye We u e Way we hey, Waka Tonka, ooh, one day. Way we hey. Thank you, and I'd like to ask uh, Jessie if she'd like to share a few words, or Bruce, or Wounded Knee. Thank you, my relatives. Thank you, Tim. My name is Jessie Riddle, and the day I met John Iverson, was over at the Maine West Convention in San Francisco. And uh, I only met him one time. But as you all know, he was quite a character. He sat there with us. <laughs> and we had a really good conversation. And knowing that he was a wounded knee veteran was really an honor to know him. This man right here, Bruce, is also a wounded knee veteran during the occupation. I was there too. So we know what it's like to fight with, against the system. The reason why I'm wearing red today is to honor the murdered and missing Native women that we have. Over 5,000 are missing just in one year alone. Several have been found without their body parts. So it's an epidemic that our people are, are being lost at a dramatic rate. I myself just buried my oldest sister yesterday. She was 81. So it's really, it's an honor to be here. And we all know that it's time that we're gonna have to go through this. An old elder who's been gone for almost 20 years now told me at my father's services that when you go into the other side, you see your family members that were born way, way, way before you ever existed. And they're there and they're waiting for you. So you're not alone when you go on the other side. Your family, your loved ones are with you. And that goes across any color. There's no barrier. There's no barrier with only here in this so-called government where they put the 
theory is that. I want to thank you all for letting me come up here and say a few words. He was quite a gentleman. Oh. <laughs> uh, my name is uh, Bruce Kelly, um, Pitt River, uh, Northern California. And, uh, uh, yeah, I'm also a, a veteran of uh, Wounded Knee. Uh, I didn't really know uh, uh, John, but uh, um, I'm also here, uh, you know, for my niece, uh, Morningstar uh, Galley. Uh, she works. She worked with the Poor People's March uh, in Sacramento, um, International Treaty Council, uh, Women's uh, uh, um, uh, Prison System, like that. And so somewhere there's a connection, you know, with John, you know, with her, uh, you know, in the Berkeley here, uh, in the Berkeley area here. And uh, she said, you know, hey, uh, she just come back from a flight from uh, from uh, uh, New York. And uh, she wanted to be here to say a few words because she's basically the, the speaker of the family, like that. So she's saying, uh, you know, uh, for her condolences, you know, for the Gallic family. Uh, here. Thank you very much. You know, right now, I wouldn't like you to film, please. Thank you, out of respect for John. Next up, we have Marvin Grant. Facebook. Facebook. It's a, po it's a uh, posting from John. He wants somebody to call him. He's lost his phone and he can't find it. <laughs> um, so I have a short poem. It's called In Lieu of Prayer. Alone, alone, when you go home, go to the mirror and dance. Thank you. Uh, the next up is Ellen Schaefer, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today. Um, she wanted to be, but she's a bit ill. And I'm going to read a statement on her behalf. How could John have died without telling me? I could rely for decades on period, periodic high-energy emails declaring his Native American heritage and his Ivy League credential, followed by Alan Schaefer. And then he'd tell me what we, and many others, also named, have to do. He was a staunch and focused fighter for decent, respectful health care for people with AIDS. We collaborated on campaigns for, accessible, for access to affordable meds. John, I'm sorry we've lost you. I'll aim to come to your memorial for perhaps the final John Iverson Presente, but you couldn't make it today. So I'm going to say and just say, John Iverson Presente. John Iverson Presente. John Iverson Presente. Next up is Ann Magnuson. She couldn't be with her today. I'll see her today. She's a singer, songwriter, actress, performance artist and all around great character. Um, uh, Jane Sloan will read your statement. A stranger once sent me a fan letter back in the mid 1980s. I sent back a reply and we soon began exchanging letters. John Iverson was a stranger no more. We became bona fide, old-fashioned pen pals, and our correspondence lasted for decades. It began during those critical years when so many of our comrades were contracting and dying of AIDS. And all of us were demonstrating, doing benefits, and screaming bloody murder at the government to wake up and take action. 
John Iverson was in the trenches, on the front lines, tenacious, courageous, a man of action, a true warrior. He fought harder than anyone I knew for better medical treatment, for a cure, and most of all, for justice. John was a great comfort to me when my brother became sick and eventually died from that terrible, terrible plague. We mailed letters to each other for years until emails and Facebook messages, alas, soon replaced the ink and created stationery. John was one of the most unique and extraordinary people I ever knew, even if I really know, only knew him from his letters, his very, very long letters. <laughs> long, long yet engaging, informative, and funny letters, which always included a flyer for the latest political action, demonstration, or AIDS news update. We met in person a few times when I performed in San Francisco. He was always near the front, supportive and enthusiastic. He encouraged me, well, let's be honest, he pestered me to use my quasi-celebrity status to get the word out about his causes. I was thrilled to do so, and especially to tell a nationwide audience about one of his important AIDS petitions while, appear, while appearing on the Conan O'Brien show, which I, had to, which I had to sneak in. I'm not sure the producers were thrilled about that political interjection, but John was, and that's all that mattered. I particularly loved his missives from Buenos Aires. He was fond of sending gifts and once mailed me a dozen Argentinian dish scrubbers, each emblazoned with Spanish text alongside an illustration of a smiling cat with a top hat and a cane. Next to this dapper cat were large letters spelling out the unlikely brand name of this foreign sponge, McPussy. <laughs> I know John is by everybody's side now, urging them to cause a commotion, to get out to vote and canvas and petition and call and write and above all, make joyful noise. John made a difference in my life and I know he made a difference in your lives as well. He made me a better person not only through his example, but also being by the being the world's best pen pal. <laughs> Goddess bless you, John. See you on the other side, and whether you're wearing something dapper like the Argentinian McPussy or draped in a feather boa, boas, as Shirley means, please, please put my name down for at least one dozen heavenly tangles. Aww. Aww. Next up would be Gar McVay Russell. Uh, Gar couldn't be with us today, but if you want to see where Gar is today, just look at the picture of him back on the wall over there. He sent a great photo of himself in an Act Up East Bay t-shirt and a raised fist. His greetings for Berlin, where he is right now. But we do have a statement from him, and Francis Phil will read that. So Gar, as many of you know, is a writer in Oakland, and he actually co-founded Act Up East Bay with John and a number of other people. Can't hear me? Thank you very much. Hi, Dal. There's an event tomorrow that we should cover. Can you stop by and pick up some flyers? <laughs> Back in the day when silence equals death, stickers appeared on lampposts everywhere. When we marched the streets to demand action on AIDS, when we were younger and angrier, I could count on receiving such a message probably once a week. John always gave his instructions with a friendly, campy voice, seasoned with a Minnesota accent. But behind the folksy charm was a serious activist. Having fought various battles all his life, the battle against AIDS undoubtedly was his most personal. He had Cyril converted early on in the AIDS of AIDS, age of AIDS, making its treatment and eradication a life and death issue due in no small part to his own personal tenacity, too hard-ass and bitchy to let death take him, he lived through the worst of it, surviving when so many others did not. I think we probably first met in the summer of 1989 at an ACT UP San Francisco meeting. Meetings in SF attracted a minimum of 75 to 100 in those days. A hearty few of us, including John, trekked across the Bay Bridge from the East Bay every Thursday evening for the meetings. John probably put the bug in our ears that we needed to start up an East Bay chapter, and you know how John worked. He made suggestions like, you should really consider doing this. <laughs> the 
and kept at you until you did it. Well, <laughs> in this case, it did not take much to convince me, Jonathan Winters, and a few others to set up the groundwork for what would become ACT UP East Bay. The group generally worked together well. HIV treatment at Highland Hospital was one of our first issues, along with education programs in Oakland. We also did work at UC Berkeley, more education, getting the word out. At its height, ACT UP East Bay had about 30 to 40 regular members. The Berkeley Needle Exchange came later, around 93 or so. And of course, no recollection of John during the ACT UP years would be complete without a mention of his sinister alter ego, Shirley Mean, <laughs> wearing, <laughs> wearing an ill-fitting dress, a wig, some pearls, and sensible pumps. John became a shrieking caricature of Berkeley's then mayor, Shirley Dean. While Mayor Dean would have been considered as left as they come in any other part of the country, in Berkeley, many thought of her as a moderate, including John. I can't recall the exact issue that caused John's ire, but my guess would be funding for AIDS in Berkeley's health, de health department. Shirley Dean visited events all over Berkeley, and every time John said he would retire the character, she came back for one more performance. <laughs> I don't know what Mayor Dean thought of this caricature, but I did know that she and John were Facebook friends. <laughs> John began getting sicker and sicker by the middle of the 90s. He was losing a lot of weight and had chronic diarrhea. I can remember that he started planning how he wanted his funeral to go, what he wanted done, etc. Of course, it wouldn't be John unless he controlled everything to the very end. <laughs> but then something extraordinary happened. John didn't die. He clung to life stubbornly, determinedly, with verb and more than a dose of gumption until the first Proteus inhibitor cocktail drugs came out around 1996. It took a while, but John returned to more or less of his old cantankerous self. Mm -hmm. With the drug cocktail lengthening the lives of those living with HIV, John's focus shifted more towards access, both at home and abroad. In truth, he always made a point of noting how trial drugs were useless if people could not get to them. He did work for AIDS in Uganda, raising money for Ugandan orphans, but his interests varied all over the map from yoga instruction Trips to trips to Argentina where he took up his tango singing. I was shocked and saddened when I heard about his death. I thought of all the good times we had together, the causes we fought for, the music we listened to, the culture we enjoyed and created, the great food we ate. I still can't believe that he's gone. I'll miss the times we had together. I'll miss the hi gal reading over the phone. <laughs> We had a, uh, a gathering in November, as I mentioned, Gar was there. So at the end of his talk, he then said the following things. And I'm gonna say it once and then please join me. Fight AIDS, fight back, act up. 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 Thank all the presenters today, folks. We kept it at about an hour. Uh, this is a miracle if you can think of it. Once, you know, like um, but we have one more uh, uh, performer, and we're very honored to have him, uh, DJ Leibowitz, who will play some of John's songs. But before I introduce him, I want to thank you all for coming. We have celebrated John, an amazing activist, artist, and friend. Thanks to all the presenters and organizers, and as DJ plays, and I ask you to sit through at least the first song, and uh, then you can go to the back where we have our refreshments, please stick around, talk to old friends, and talk to new acquaintances. That was one of the great things in November. You got to learn, you meet a lot of new people you've never met before. And as somebody just said, we're all one people. And uh, if we all keep working and celebrating, uh, what did Emma Goldman say? If I can't, if I can't dance, I don't want to meet your revolution. Um, and remember that John was able to do all of that. DJ Leibowitz. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. So stay around for that. One other thing I want to mention: if you're a real stalwart and uh, having a great time, 
We're going to repair it about 2 o'clock to the Triple Rock Brewery, 1920 Shattuck, a block, one and a half blocks north of the university. You're all welcome to come to have the beverage of your choice, alcoholic or not, and uh, come to that. So, wait. No, uh, no, no. Uh, some of us are going to stay past 2 p.m. to clean up. Uh, and you're welcome to stay for that, too. But uh, 2 p.m. is when uh, people are going to the bar. I think if you go away for three hours, you're never going to show up again. So, uh, And again, don't feel like you have to come or even stay around here, but we hope you do it for at least some of it. DJ Lee Woods is a solo rock and roll piano player. We learned a couple of songs from a Stickers demo tape. And one of those songs in his albums, and you recorded, uh, Beware of the Piano, hit number one at KALX Radio, uh, which uh, Chip was also at, and was in the top ten on several college radio stations across the United States. Here he is to play a few songs by John Iverson. Please welcome DJ Lee Woods. <laughs> DJ. He has a regular gig in San Francisco. Where? Madrone Art Bar on Fridays from roughly 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. and also 83 First Street in downtown San Francisco on Tuesdays roughly 6 p.m. from past 8 p.m. Admission is free to both, but you have to be at least 21. <laughs> <laughs> I love you with this qualified audience. So, um, and again, I'd like to thank you for doing it. One, one request. Uh, actually, there's one song. Actually, I'm just going to say a few are. A few words. Uh, this is one of John's songs, one of my favorites, but I think very prominent. Hold on to each other. We're all we have today. Hold on to each other. 
There is no other way. Um, it's a great song by John. I'm going to turn it back to the DJ, but I want him to also announce, he's going to announce all the songs. Tell us the one that was your big, your big John Iverson hit that actually most of us have never heard of. So. I'm saving that for last. The one I just did is called Car Radio. That, that was a demo that I found at Calix Radio. And uh, I was uh, briefly booking shows for a, for a nightclub or a bar in East Bay, and it, that never panned out, but bands were sending me tapes, and Josh showed up at one of my piano gigs and put a stickers demo tape in my tip jar. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, took the tape home. I liked the songs. I learned a couple of them, played them at my gigs, and I decided to put one of them on my album. I'll be playing that in a few minutes, but first I'd like to play another song from that tape. It's called Burn You. And here we go. <laughs> Burn You by the Stickers. <laughs> to just stay and mingle uh, until 3 o'clock, not until 2, uh, but you can also head over to the bar whenever you want to. And here's to DJ for some more songs. Now another song on that demo tape that John dropped in my tip jar was called Jumpstart My Heart, and that's the song I chose for my LP. So here we go, Jumpstart My Heart by the Spirits. <laughs> Thank you. 